Pursuant to Section 84-1411 of the Nebraska Statutes, notice of this meeting was given on February 4th, 2022. The meeting will convene at 6.30 p.m. and visitors may obtain a request to be heard form from staff for any presentation they may have for the meeting. In accordance with policy, the request to be heard forms must be submitted to the secretary within the first five minutes of the board meeting in order to be heard at this meeting. Agenda items are subject to reordering at the discretion of the board president. Please attend the entire meeting to ensure you're able to hear any discussion. Pursuant to Section 84-1411 of the Nebraska Statutes, the next regular board meeting of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District 0001 and the Board of Educational Service Unit Number 19 
will be held on Thursday, February 24th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the board meeting room of the Teacher Administrative Center, 3215 Cumming Street. The agenda will be kept current and available for public inspection in the Office of the Secretary of the Board of Education at the administrative building during regular working hours. Pursuant to Section 84-1412 of the Nebraska Statutes, the public is hereby informed that a current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted in the board meeting room on the north wall. Just one moment, please. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Please stand and join us for the presentation of colors and the Pledge of Allegiance led by South High School JROTC. You may be seated. Vice President Erdenberger will lead us in the OPS vision and mission statement. Thank you, President Holman, and you can follow it at the top of your agenda. OPS is vision, every student, every day, prepared for success, and the mission to prepare all students for success in college, career, and life. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Cassidy, Erdenberger. Here. Head. Present. Holman. Present. Juarez. Here. Cracky. Here. Smith. Here. Snow. Teelan. Here. Seven present. Colleagues, I did hear from uh, Mrs. Cassidy that she will not be able to make tonight's meeting, but I did not hear from Mr. Snow. Is there a motion to approve today's absences? Can I divide the question, please? Yes. I move we um, excuse the absence of Ms. Cassidy. Second. There is a motion on the floor to excuse the absence of Ms. Cassidy, seconded by Ms. Cracky. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Head. Aye. Holman. Aye. Juarez. Aye. Cracky. Aye. Smith. Aye. Teelan. Aye. Erdberger. Aye. Aye. Seven aye. Motion carries. Moving on to school spotlight. And we have Mr. Maskell here with us this evening. Good evening. Good evening, President Holman, Vice President Erdenberger, members of the board, and Superintendent Logan. Tonight's OPS Proud Spotlight is a video recognizing the 27 high school students across our district who earned a place in all state music ensembles for the 21 22 school year. So, before the all state experience, I hadn't, I hadn't been in the choir where everyone really wanted to be there. Uh, and I think finally being in a place where everyone felt the same about music, I realized other people really want to do this. And if I'm in other, on other choirs, um, I can get more of that feeling and continue getting, continue growing with opportunities. Oh, I am big into music outside. Like I play guitar, piano, bass, and I make beats. 
and sing and stuff, make my own music. And choir is really kind of an outlet that I can ex uh, express my vocal passion for. I mean, vocal passion as well as my musical passion. I'd say it's like a passion uh, because I am very involved in music and want to do that as a future career. I think every school benefits from it. I think for our students, they get the experience of none of our programs really have a 300, 400 member choir. And it just, as the youth say, hits a little bit differently when you're singing in that large of a, uh, an ensemble. I think that we also get to bring our experiences as an urban district. I think that is something our students also get to bring. I think that's a really unique opportunity that we don't always get to have, is to share that music with the rest of the state. And we will have all of our students' names in addition to previous posts on social media in tomorrow's Board Digest for all staff in our community as well. Congratulations to our all-state musicians. Thank you, Mr. Maskell. Moving on to Board and Superintendent Communications. First, we have Treasurer's Report, but um, unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Roberts is unable to be here this evening. If you do have any questions, colleagues, please let Mr. Ray know. And now, Dr. Logan. Good evening, President Holman, Vice President Erdenberger, members of the board, those here in attendance and watching from home. To begin February, Nebraska celebrated School Board Recognition Week. Thank you to our nine locally elected volunteers who invest countless unpaid hours for our 9,000 staff and 53,000 students. You are serving, some even joining this board through challenging times. The work is more important than ever. That service is seen and appreciated. We should all be proud that even though such challenging times, Omaha Public Schools continues to lead locally and nationally for children. Uh, as you may recall, our district stood up additional COVID-19 testing bandwidth for symptomatic Omaha Public Schools students and staff in January. During a wave of COVID infections, our student community services team facilitated sites in North and South Omaha. This was part of our layered approach to responsibly maintaining in-person learning. As planned, those sites concluded operations at the end of January, and we facilitated more than 500 tests. Our thanks to the Children's Hospital Medical Center and the Nebraska DHHS to make it possible. On tonight's agenda, we are happy to share an update on our freshman academies. Our board approved the implementation of freshman academies in March of 2021. As our freshmen complete this school year, ninth grade students will transition into a college and career academy or pathway for their sophomore through senior years. While we are in a, the baseline year for implementation, we are encouraged by the staff and family engagement and early feedback from parents across our district. This work is about expanding access and elevating expectations, connecting students to their high schools and connecting learning goals for life after graduation. Uh, and, and in connection with that, our district is looking for high school students interested in, in exploring teaching as a profession. We're hiring paid student interns again this summer. Student interns will mentor and tutor elementary students in small groups guided by a certified teacher. Applicants must be at least 16 years old and in good standing at school. Credit verification and background checks are conducted. Interns will support next level learning in June and July. This is another long-term strategy to build a highly qualified educator pipeline and addressing staffing in the education field. Learn more at www.ops.org. Seniors, financial assistance is available to help pay for college. Yes, it's that time of year for the free application for federal student aid, also known as FAFSA. You could receive some of the $120 billion in grants work study programs and other programs from the United States Department of Education. We've posted information on our web website, just enter uh, go.ops.org forward slash FAFSA. The African American History Challenge was held on Saturday. This weekend we had several teams competing in the African American History Challenge. As our district celebrates Black History Month, we thank one, the 100 Black Men of Omaha for hosting this annual competition, bringing history to life for students. Winners will be announced soon, and I have to tell you, I almost accidentally announced them on, on Twitter on Saturday after I left, um, but I quickly took it down. Um, but I do know who the winners are. I'm very excited for those two schools, and we look forward to honoring our champions at a future Board of Education. This is just one of the many activities we have to celebrate the rich black history that is a part of the Omaha Public Schools. 
And finally, congratulations are in order for the students who participated in this weekend's All City Music Festival at the Holland Performing Arts Center. What a fantastic opportunity and experience for All City in this, in this year and every year. Maria Jimenez for earning Outstanding School Psychology student from the Nebraska School Psych Psychologists Association to Don Hannon of Brian, High, of Brian High for placing first in vocal music in all category at the Living the Dream Performance Art Competition. To Daphne Valadez, to Mikael Thomas, Don Hannon, and Julie Irejeta Umana of Brian High, whose performances at the Living the Dream Competition won Brian High the 2022 Multicultural and Social Justice School of the Year Award. To Hannah Ajaboje from Burke High for her recognition in this month's NSAA and U.S. Bank Believers and Achievers. And to Justin Davis of Central High for marking 100 pins and 129 wins with Eagle Wrestling. That is truly a wonderful accomplishment for Justin. This concludes my remark. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Colleagues, Mr. Head. Thank you, President Dr. Holman. Um, so I've had a busy last couple of months. Um, I've avoided kind of saying anything about this publicly, I guess, outside of the board table, just because I don't like bringing attention to myself. But now that I'm no longer doing it, um, I felt the felt the need to say uh, say a couple of thank yous. Uh, so between Thanksgiving and end of January, my tenure was cut a little bit short due to uh, workflow changes at my uh, my full time job. Uh, but I had been helping out in district transportation as a bus aide driving uh, driving vans and driving a school bus. Um, had the opportunity to meet uh, a lot of you know exceptional drivers, aides. Um, you know, just extremely dedicated, hardworking people. So I wanted to thank uh, thank all of them for their you know for their kind words, for their support. Um, you know, also all the the trainers, um, you know, supervisors, everybody over there. Uh, also had the ability to meet with a lot of uh, a lot of great, really professional teachers, paras, uh, specifically at Druid Hill Element Elementary. Um, so thank you to all of them. It was a great uh, great opportunity, as far as I'm aware. I I think I still have a CDL, so hopefully I'll be able to drive at some point again in the, in the uh, future. Um, but uh, you know, if anybody is looking for uh, has a CDL and is looking for a great place to drive, OPS Transportation is the place for you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Head. We appreciate you taking on that um, extra challenge of drive, actually getting your CDL right, yeah. and driving a bus for our students and families. We appreciate it. Any colleagues on this side before I go to? No. All right, Vice President Erdenberger. Thank you, President Holman. Um, I, have, I have written my comments this uh, week because I want to make sure I get them right um, as follows. Congratulations to students, families, and OPS staff for completing a busy and challenging start to our second semester in the 2021-22 school year and the fifth semester of everyone in the district coping with the worldwide COVID emergency. I want to sincerely acknowledge the hard, even exhausting work being done by the teachers and staff and administration. With foresight, careful monitoring, and our focus on health and safety, we've been able to continue our core mission, teaching children in person even as schools around the country and in our metro area have had to resort to remote learning. Thank you to everyone that has had to work harder and differently to meet the needs of our students. We can't change our core mission and obviously don't want to, but I want to note some of the things that I have seen our district do to support our staff with more time and more staffing to meet that core mission. In January, other metro districts identified up to four school days as non-student contact days. I think it's worth mentioning that in August, our district slash superintendent anticipated there would be a need for additional staff time this year and adjusted our calendar throughout the school year to add five non-student contact days, each of them as an extension to a weekend, including I wish I was still teaching a full week at Thanksgiving. 
One of those days was just last Friday when our district allowed additional flexibility in authorized remote participation by students uh, on that curriculum day. For the most part, only people with teaching certificates or limited similar authorization can sub in our schools. We hear a lot about why aren't more people just showing up to sub. You need a teaching certificate. Since the beginning of the last school year, many certificated staff at TAC have been regularly substitute teaching in our schools. Earlier this year, non-certificated classified staff at TAC have started supporting schools a few hours each week in a variety of roles such as supervision in lunchrooms and dismissal. This would be where I would point out that one of our board members decided to drive a bus. More than 50 concierge team members have started working in our schools since we launched that program in the fall, and the district is still recruiting more of these paid part-time volunteers. By the way, starting this year, OPS also pays the highest rate in the metro area to its substitute teachers. Planning ahead, OPS is the only metro area school district paying a stipend to student teachers and we're paying the primary teachers to supervise them. We look forward to those student teachers deciding to join the OPS team next fall. The superintendent mentioned summer interns. That program adds bandwidth for summer learning, engages students in paid work, and provides a college and career experience for high schoolers considering teaching as a profession. And we look forward to those students deciding to join the OPS team down the line as well. As a former teacher, I know that even in so-called normal times, there is never enough time or coverage so I wanted to note how these issues are being addressed in these abnormal times. I also know there is never enough appreciation for the extraordinary commitment and hard work of staff throughout our organization and in every role to meet our core mission. Thank you for this opportunity to say you are heard, you are appreciated, and to share how we've tried to find more time and more coverage and are planning ahead when our mission is so critical. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Erneberger, for your very sincere words. Moving on now to public comment and recognition. Masks are required to be worn in order to speak during public comment. If you are not wearing a mask, a mask will be provided to you at the podium to wear while speaking. Tonight we have four speakers who have submitted requests to speak forms. The board has adopted policy 8346 which provides public comment for a period of one hour. That same policy limits individual speakers, speakers to a maximum of five minutes. We ask that you respect that time limit. Mr. Ray will let you know when you have one minute remaining and when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you're in need of an interpreter, please let Mr. Ray know and one will be provided for you. We ask that you respect the opinions of all who speak and that you refrain from applause and other outbursts during the presentations. If the subject of your public comment is related to a particular student or staff member, we ask that you not identify the student or staff member and instead provide that information to Mr. Ray. He will assist us into looking into those types of specifics for you. If you do not get an opportunity to speak and would like to submit any written commentary, please provide it to Mr. Ray. He will make sure that each member of the board gets a copy. As a reminder, with the last year's passage of LB 83, by the Nebraska Legislature, the Board of Education is legally obligated to require any member of the public desiring to address the board to identify him or herself, including an address and the name of any organization you may represent unless the requirement is waived for security reasons. Tonight we have one um, request that the board waive the requirement that they state their address at the podium for security reasons. And that person is Michaela Kayser. I will entertain a motion to waive the requirement that those named individuals state their address at the podium. Okay, I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Okay, there is no second. So, Mrs. Kayser, you will have to state your address at the podium. 
We ask that all other individuals please state and spell your first and last name, state your current address, and let us know if you're here representing any particular organization before you begin your public comment. Those individuals covered by a previous motion need not provide their address. In addition, we ask that you remain seated until called to the podium. Please remain at the podium and do not approach the board table. If you have materials to distribute, please let me know and Mr. Ray will come and get them from you. It is now 6.50 p.m. and our first speaker is Michaela Kayser. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Michaela Kayser, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-K-A-Z-O-R. And my address is 11619 Grand Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska. And I have some material to give. I am asking if I am, if I am able to take my mask off um, according to the mask mandate, it says that if you are six feet away and if you um, are public speaking, it says that you do not have to wear a mask according to the Nebraska Department of Health. You have to leave your mask on, please. And could okay. you pull it up over your nose? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Michaela Kayser and I'm here today to speak about the books that I found on the OPS online catalogs and the results that these books have on the children that are reading them. Before I begin, I would like to let everyone know who I am. I attend a church in, here in Omaha that is very diverse. There are just as many people of color as there are pe um, people who have white skin, but that doesn't mean anything to me. I have a leader at my church who has dark skin and I call her my aunt. I have a pastor who I consider a second father to me and he has dark skin. I attend multiple prayer groups a week with people of different skin tones. I worship Jesus every single Sunday, not caring what the person next to me looks like. In fact, I work at a nonprofit where, there are, where uh, over half of our clients are Latino or have darker skin color. And I love and pray for each and every person who wants me to pray for them. Psalm 127 states, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. As we see through the eyes of the word, as we see through the word of God, children are precious in the sight of God, and they should be in our eyes too, which is why I'm speaking out against the evil, perverse material that I found in the library books at, in Omaha Public Schools. The books that I found are targeted towards high schoolers, but that doesn't mean anything because high schoolers are just as precious to Jesus as children who are five years old. The, the books that I found, I found on the Omaha Central and Omaha Burke online ca library catalogs. The, one of the books is called Black Flamingo by Dean Atta. The, the um, summary of the book is Michael is a mixed race gay teen growing up in London. All his life he's navigated what it means to be a Greek Cypriot and Jamaican, but never quite felt, but never quite feeling Greek or black enough. As he gets older, Michael's coming out is only the start of learning who he is and where he fits in. When he discovers a drag society, he finally finds where he belongs, and the black flamingo is born. That was provided by the publisher. The other books I found are You're in the Wrong Bathroom and 20 Other Myths and Misconceptions about transgender and gender nonconforming people by Laura Erica, Erickson Schroth. The other book I found is Trans Plus, Love, Sex, Romance, and Being You by Catherine Gonzalez, a guide for teens who are transgender, non-binary, gender conforming, gender fluid, or questioning their gender identity, and for cis allies. Trans Plus answers all the hard questions about gender expression and identity, covers mental health, physical health and reproduction, transitioning, relationships, sex, and life as a trans or non-buried individual. I found another book called Class Act by Jerry Craft. Eighth grader Drew Ellis recognizes that he isn't afforded the same opportunities, no matter how hard he works. That is, privileged classmates, and they're talking about white privilege here, at the Riverdale Academy Day of School take for granted. And to make matters worse, Drew begins to feel as if his good friend Liam might be one of those privileged kids and is finding it hard to not withdraw, even as their mutual friend Jordan tries to keep their group of friends together. And then I found another book named When, you Call, when They Call You a Terrorist, a Black Lives Matter memoir by Patrice Concolores. A memoir by the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement explains the movement's position of love, humanity, and justice, challenging perspectives and have ne that have ne negatively labeled the movement's act activists while calling for essential One political minute. changes. 
The results of these books are making kids confused and not knowing what is right from wrong and evil and good. These are evil and the word of God clearly states that everyone is the same in the eyes of God and that there are two genders, male and female. There are not 20. And parents, you need to stand up. And if you're wondering what you need to do to stand up, you, you can first check what exactly is in your, in your child's curriculum and call your school and school district's representative to confront the evil ideology that is trying to be seconds. established in your children. Second, we need parents to come up boldly and speak at these school boards meeting. And thirdly, inform your children with truth and if needed, pull your kids out of school like my parents had to do with me. We need parents and other students to rise up and boldly speak with truth because as Romans 831 states, if God is for us, who can be against us? God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Case. Next, we have Larry Storer. This is a great night. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. I second that young lady's presentation. Tonight, I'd like to speak uh, primarily about comprehensive sex education. Most of these are my notes. We know that things are creeping into the school systems all over the country, but particularly in Nebraska now. Last week, the Nebraska Board of uh, Department of Education had some hearings. It wasn't very pretty because of comprehensive sex education and critical race theory. However, it's creaky, creeping in towards Omaha any day now because it, they got by with it in Lincoln, they're gonna get by with it here. So we wanna preempt you because well, the citizen gets very little opportunity for example, tonight, if there's only six of us and you grant us one hour, we should get 10 minutes each, I believe, but you probably won't grant us a second opportunity. So anyway, we ask you to preempt this uh, uh, grab for power. We ask you to oppose the, any proposed ordinances, rules, regulations, redefining sex to include sexual orientation and gender identity in whatever title, whatever city code or state law there is. Our existing laws, which you swore to, protect, already protect citizens, all citizens, regardless of race or sex or orientation or gender identity. <clears throat> Males or females who self-identify as one or the other should not have to have access, uh, share access to private spaces, and particularly in our school locker rooms and restrooms that are specifically dined for designed for the biological sex, which is determined by what it is when you are born. If there's doubt, you should look and, and, and see, <coughs> uh, particularly in restrooms and locker rooms. Uh, rather than preventing actual discrimination, these gender identity policies and racial have been used to violate the rights of people who do not conform to one particular view on sex, race, or gender, especially on citizens' rights, which everybody has equal, according to our Constitution, mind you. Our First Amendment freedoms and the privacy and safety of young males, girls, and women, specifically not a combination of, should, be should not be compromised by policies that empower government, which we threw off of a government that did this type of thing uh, way back in the days to unfairly force citizens to share their private spaces with male or female or transgenders. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Citizens are forcing school boards all across the country to bow out of the National Association of School Boards because we want you guys to make the decisions based on discussions among yourselves and with us not with the National Association of School Boards. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Robert Miller. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Robert Miller. That's R-O-B-E-R-T-M-I-L-L-E-R. And I reside at 7301 North 107th Avenue in Omaha, Nebraska, 68122. Good evening, President Holman, Vice President Ergenberger, Superintendent Dr. Logan, and members of the board. My name is Robert Miller, and I'm the president of the Omaha Education Association. First, I'd like to say thank you 
for allowing the staff to participate in the virtual scheduled PD in a location of their choosing on Friday, February 4th. It was appreciated. Ms. Erdenberger, I appreciate you identifying the steps that the district has done to address some of our concerns. Thank you. However, we cannot stop there. If compensation cannot be considered due to current budget, then we, then why not look at something that will not address our, or adjust our budget? Again, we are asking for a moratorium to be placed on grade level meetings, PLCs, and any new initiatives that are set to be rolled out and limiting staff meetings to once a month. Now this is not time to add more to the plate of the overflowing of the items that the staff has to be faced with by the district. Those that are in the classroom are faced with challenges each and every day, but despite of all those challenges, they continue to do the job, take on additional students, and the constant reviewing of our students who are not present or have missed instruction time due to something outside of their control. There's not enough time in the day. Trying to catch up on students, trying to meet expectations, map testing, all of these things that educators must hit and must do, it's hard, it's daunting. The staffing crisis continues to be an issue that will not be fixed this year. Teachers are aware of the staff who work out of tech who are coming out into the buildings to offer support but that support is strongly needed in the classroom. I understand the OPS has limited on the assignments that they can offer, but from, to those that are from the TAF building, but the pressure needs to be released from the classroom. We can and we must further address ways to limit the challenges being faced by our staff. Again, placing a moratorium on a grade level meetings, PLCs, new initiatives, and one staff meeting a month to allow staff time to get work done during the day. It costs nothing. And it must be accomplished because they do not have time currently. Now I want to close with a few celebrations. Some of the board members currently are aware of the annual celebration that the OEA puts on honoring our members who have retired or dedicated 25 years to OPS. And some of the recipients from the Omaha public community or Omaha community for their support to our students. But due to the pandemic, we were not able to celebrate the years of 2020 and 2021. So let me t inform you some of the awards that were given out. In 2020, if you would add the number of years that were dedicated to the many children that entered the classrooms, it would be 1,730 years. That's just the Omaha Education members. The Spirit of Collaboration Award was given to Ms. Kay Kennedy, a principal at Dundee. In her nomination, a quote was shared, the greatest gift of leadership is a boss who wants you to be successful. And Ms. Kennedy does exactly that. The Human Relations Award was given to the Minnesota Humanities Center for their work in providing the OPS teachers educational engagement by recognizing and appreciating the depth and richness of the expressions and excellence within the communities of Omaha. The John A. Jensen Memorial Award was awarded to the Boys and Girls Club of the Midlands who offer programs and services to help our young people in our district to, succeed, to succeed in school develop, school, develop leadership skills, and maintain healthy lifestyles. And in 2021, if you would add the number of years of those who retired who were OEA members, you would get 1,920 One years of dedicated in improving the lives of our students. The Spirit of Collaboration Award was awarded to Dr. Carrie Carr, who was a principal at Norris Middle School and now the principal at the Buena Vista High School. Human Relations was the Omaha Croc Center. Johnny Jensen was the Food Bank of the Heartland. And the Rookie of the Year, there were three of them that we awarded. A teacher, Jared Gegsna, a PE teacher at ILP, and a Goman, an inclusive teacher, and Maritza Vasquez, a fourth grade teacher at Field Club. This is just one of the many reasons why you have dedicated staff in OPS a total of 3,650 years to education. OEA wants to work with the district to identify an immediate solution to ease the pressure being felt by many, if not all the staff in the district. The students are counting on us to do the right thing. That's time. Thank you. Thank you. I do have um, the, a copy of the program that typically is given out at our Laurels Night that you can see a list of all the retirees. Madam President, could uh, we give a round of applause for the teachers that won that award? Sure. Thank you. Okay, 
thank you. And our next speaker for tonight is Casey Crawford. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Casey Crawford, C-A-S-E-Y-C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D, uh, 13509 Boyd Street. I realize coming up here saying my name is Casey Crawford probably raised a little bit of blood pressure over the last couple of weeks. And I'd imagine most of the people here and probably in the back row are tired of seeing my name in emails. But nonetheless, I promise we're looking for something good. So uh, my name is Casey Crawford. I'm the parent of a fifth grader at Alice Buffett Middle School who's been bullied consistently for the last seven months. He feels unsafe at school and with the amount of time that has passed without resolution, he no longer trusts that he can reach out to the adults in school for help when he needs it. School claims that with each complaint, they investigate and evoke consequences. However, with each report we made, the issue has gotten worse. This bullying has progressed from teasing to pushing to threats to students following my son after school and throwing the contents of his backpack. Seven months, more than a dozen emails, and only two options. Ignore it or move classes. Uh, and by doing so, you'd be accommodating the bully. The school chose to do both by ignoring their bullied students' concerns and further alienating him by moving him out of classes with a handful of friends that he's made. The only thing we've received as the parents of the victim is defensiveness and lip service, which led us to share uh, and shed a more public light on these issues. I don't feel that I should have to go to the lengths that I've gone to to receive such a limited response, and I fear that for those going through something similar, there may not be a lot of time left. The reality is that some children kill themselves when they experience these traumas and see through their school's lack of response that nothing will change for them. In publicizing these concerns, we found ourselves overwhelmed by the number of parents who not only supported us, but shared equal concerns after experiencing similar issues at the same school and the resulting lack of action. Even more unexpected were the outpouring of teachers and staff members currently employed by Alice Buffett who felt their voices were not heard when they raised bullying concerns they face in the school. I'm sorry, clear, could you make sure to refrain from using any of the school's name or any other identifying information? Sure, I, no problem, I apologize. Um, uh, to be clear, the teachers and staff members uh, are staying their bullies, uh, they're victims of bullying themselves. Uh, to be fair and transparent, we've also received opposition in the form of two individuals um, who've sent messages uh, and the sender couldn't believe that we'd ever say such things about a school that they love but not everyone experiences bullying, and we can be grateful for that fact, but you can't discount the rest of us. To those two individuals, and to anyone who holds that same thought, I hope you never have to experience sending your child to school, not knowing if they will come back the same person. I hope you don't have to sit in the car after school, watching the clock, wondering if the bully made good on their threats. Hope that when you see the school's phone number show up, that your heart doesn't sink, and the thought that today's the day that someone really hurt your child goes through your mind. Hope that one day I can live that carefree again. I hope that the fearful teachers can find peace and balance in their workplace. I hope the parents with children at the end of their rope can provide support and guidance when the school fails their children. But hope is not a plan. Hope does not make things better. Hope does not lead to results. So I'm setting aside my hope and I'm asking you and I'm calling you to action because action leads to results. So here's my request. Develop a new plan and procedure to provide more transparency to the parents of your students. In that plan, build a system online to house metrics regarding your climate, including teacher, student, and parent culture surveys. Include an online bullying form and tracking system so we all know how many submissions have been received and how many have been resolved. One minute. If you take this as seriously as the hundreds of people who've reached out to us, who provide, who count on me to provide you with this feedback, um, but have chose to avoid the public scrutiny that I'm putting myself through right now, you will enact this policy of transparency, provide a plan, and share all the results. Your students, staff, and teachers deserve to be heard and made to feel safe inside school walls. Your parents deserve a deeper understanding of what is happening in their children's school. I hope that with all I've gone through to get here, that you hear the message. 30 seconds. Build the policies to support those of us who are struggling with potentially life-altering issues within your schools. I realize that change is scary, but no one should fear taking a stand against bullying. Please be brave, admit that you have a problem, and make a change. Thank you.
Thank you. Moving on to consent agenda, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda that is before us. So move. Is there a second? Okay. Um, I will be abstaining from item I-14 due to um, due to my work at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Are there any other abstentions? Mr. Snow? Roll call, Mr. Ray. Holman. Aye. Juarez. Aye. Cracky. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Thielen. Aye. Bernberger. Aye. Head. Aye. Eight aye. Motion carries, and I did not mention it, but the motion was made by Mr. Smith and it was seconded by Mr. Head for the record. Moving on to action items, items J1A, approval of the report of the legislative committee, including recommended legislative positions, and Mr. Head will be sharing with us tonight. Yes, thank you, President Dr. Holman. Um, we have, sorry, I just turned my mic off. Um, we've got about 60 bills on the agenda tonight. Um, so in order to get through at least the, the first part a little bit more quickly, um, if it's all right with you, Dr. Holman, I was just gonna read the uh, bill numbers and our uh, suggested position. And then if anybody has any questions, we can go into more depth on the bills that way. Yes. Perfect. All right, um, so the first one up, I'll just go in numerical order, uh, LB 690 uh, by Senator Blood. Uh, we're recommending we monitor that one. Uh, LB 700, Senator Coulterman, we are recommending we support it. LB 735, Senator Bostar, we're recommending a monitor position. LB 743, Senator Erdman, uh, monitor. LB 768, Senator Albright, uh, oppose. LB 780, Senator Gregert, support. LB 852, Senator Day, support. Uh, LB 860, Senator Pauls, oppose. LB 872, Senator Brewer, support. Uh, LB 888, Senator Day, support. Uh, LB 906, Senator Ben Hansen, monitor. LB 912, Senator Moorfeld, uh, monitor. LB 945, Senator Linehan is support. Uh, LB 960, Senator Vargas, monitor. Uh, LB 982, Senator Hilkeman is a uh, monitor. LB 986, Senator Breesey, and LB 987, Senator Breesey oppose both. Um, LB 997, Senator Day is monitor. LB 1001, Senator Erdman is opposed. Uh, LB 1018, Senator McKinney is opposed. Uh, 1034, Senator Pauls is monitor. 1043, Senator Coulterman is support. Uh, LB 1068, Senator Stinner is monitor. 1077, Senator Ben Hansen is opposed. Uh, 1078, Senator Ben Hansen is monitor. 1112, Senator McKinney is monitor. 1128, Senator DeBoer is support. Uh, 1143, Senator Linehan is monitor. 1158, Senator Sanders is monitor. 1169, Senator Linehan is support. Uh, 1170, Senator Sanders is monitor. 1179, Senator Groney is opposed. Uh, 1200, Senator Holloran is monitor. 1207, Senator Groney is opposed. Uh, 1211, Senator Linehan is monitor. 1212, Senator Linehan is opposed. Uh, 1213, Senator Albright is monitor. 1218, by the Education Committee, is monitor. Uh, 1219, by Senator Sanders, monitor. 1237, by Senator Brewer, is opposed. 1242, Senator Merman is opposed. 12, uh, 1250, Senator Ben Hansen is monitor. 1251, Ben Hansen is opposed. Uh, LR 263 CA by Senator Blood is monitor. LR 278 CA by Senator Linehan is monitor. Um, and then a, uh, a new one, sorry, it's out of order. Uh, LB 9, or sorry, 798 
um, by the Urban Affairs Committee is neutral. Uh, and then there's a couple other bills uh, specific to ARPA funding uh, that we took positions on. Uh, LB 696 by Senator Blood is monitor. LB 1085, Senator Panzing Brooks support. 1087 by Senator Stinner is support. 1131, Senator Moorfeld is monitor. 1161, Senator Wishart is monitor. 1167, Senator Flood is support. Uh, 1182, Senator Panzing Brooks is monitor. 11, or sorry, 1217, uh, Senator Walls is support. 1220, Senator Moorfeld is monitor. And 1240, Senator Albright is monitor. And I probably should have said this before going through all those, but there is a list um, in Spark attached to the agenda for anybody in the public who wants to see the bills that we're taking positions on as well. Um, so if anybody has any questions on any of the bills we covered. Mr. Snow. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Mr. Head, um, the position on LB 798, um, we took a position of neutral. Um, first is why we took a position on neutral, and I'm not sure if the board has ever taken a, a neutral position on a bill other than just support or against or just ignore it. Yeah, so, so this one we've had actually a lot of conversation on. Uh, specifically, it's a uh, TIF bill about um, e extremely blighted properties and whether or not um, you know, they can qualify for the extra TIF that passed under the Constitutional Amendment in 2020. Um, it's not necessarily something that directly impacts the school district and is something that OPS has refrained from weighing in on in the past. Um, we d we didn't really want to get involved in the argument of you know whether or not TIF is a good or a bad thing or whether or not we we like or don't like specific TIF projects. Um, our, uh, our our thought process there was more just to you know say something because at the end of the day TIF does have some impact on uh, on, a, on a school district on us by freezing property valuations um, you know for 15, 20, sometimes 25 years. Um, and so that's why we had the, the neutral position to kind of avoid taking the stance of supporting or opposing uh, individual projects, but saying, you know, hey, keep in mind TIF does impact school districts to an extent. I understand um, the committee's position on that, but I mean, you're talking 20 years where that tax rate that they're at stays uh, and they're paying that rate that's two generations of students that we have coming through, <clears throat> I would just think that taking a neutral position, just in my opinion, is more of, we know it affects us negatively, but we don't want to be a part of it. And it seems like we're still getting involved instead of just not taking a position at all. No, I, I, I appreciate your thought, your thought process there. And personally, I'm somewhat sympathetic to it. Um, you know, TIF doesn't necessarily negatively affect the district. Um, theoretically, the way state aid works is since the property valuations are frozen in time, our state aid increases. And so theoretically, the state doesn't decrease state aid. We stay whole, obviously. We understand how state aid has worked over the past 20, 25 years. Um, but that's that's about where the, the committee fell, that, fell on it, so. Thank you, I appreciate that and I think uh, just around this, not just this bill, but uh, a lot of projects going on in the city are really gonna impact our school district um, because it's good to look 20 years ahead, but nobody in this room is gonna be here for 20 years. And that next group is gonna have to deal with what we allow to happen. But I thank you and appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Any other questions? All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the committee's new recommendations as represented in the attached a doc a document. So moved. All right. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Juarez. Yes. Cracky. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Teelan. Aye. Erdenberger. Aye. Head. Aye. Holman. Aye. Eight aye. Motion carries. Okay, item J1B, approval of updates to the strategic plan of action. And this evening we have 
Dr. Crow and Dr. Fulmore, welcome. Good evening, thank you so much. Uh, Just right before you get started, first of all, thank you for being here, Dr. Crow and Dr. Fulmore. Um, in February of 2020, we approved the Strategic Plan of Action, and about four, eight days later, uh, we realized that we would be um, transitioning to uh, a, a different format for schooling. Uh, one of the things that we promised in the Strategic Plan of Action was that it would be a living document and that it would need to iterate change from time to time. Uh, and so tonight is an update based on some of the uh, updates that we feel are necessary as a, as a, as a school administration. Uh, and it, in terms of, um, and some shifting priorities and some things we already uh, have achieved, for example, in our strategic plan that you will see in a few minutes, one of our uh, goals was to become a one-to-one -one district. Well, we literally ended up doing that in two months uh, between January, uh, June of 2020 and uh, August of 2020. So I uh, wanted to just set the context and have uh, Dr. Crow and uh, Dr. Fulmore uh, go through the details. Thank you so much, Dr. Logan. I appreciate it. Uh, so as Dr. Logan said, in collaboration with many members of the uh, of district leadership, it did become apparent that our strategic plan of action, while serving as a roadmap, should also be a living document that uh, we update with a regular cadence. Uh, to this end, we've adjusted, or we're asking to adjust, many of our 2025 uh, end dates to a yearly continuous improvement cycle. This allows us the opportunity to, to realign resources once a goal is attained or is near completion. Additionally, by shifting to a more proactive strategic plan of action, it allows you, our Board of Education, as well as the superintendent, the opportunity to more regularly assess our priorities and accountability practices. So what we're asking of you this evening is for your vote of approval to update some of our current strategic plan of action goals. Beginning with our first strategic priority, academics, goal one will be shifted to June of 2022. Work on research as academic needs and intervention indicator is well underway. In partnership with IMS, our research department has developed and deployed the dashboard to our schools and trainings have taken place and a user guide has been created. We're currently working on garnering feedback from these use cases to improve the functionality uh, of this dashboard so uh, before it's considered a final product. And here for goal two, the only update is to shift the initial date of June 2025 to reflect that yearly benchmark. So uh, the phrasing of this goal, will uh, we will remove by June of 2025 and have it read annually. Each school will have 4% more kindergarten through third grade students, which is about 606 students, uh, that will read on grade level as measured by standard district assessments. For goal three, Again, this update is simply removing the June 2025 end date. And uh, this one will read each year, every high school will increase the percentage of ninth through 12th grade students identified as on track by 5%, which would equate to about 400 students. Uh, for this goal, we are removing the June 2025 end date and including an annual 3% target goal or uh, 213 more growth goals achieved. Uh, and 107 more students reaching their growth goals in both math, math and reading. So, uh, so I'm sorry, so this goal will read, student groups in each middle school will meet or exceed growth goals in math and reading by 3% annually. And uh, as articulated by Dr. Logan, we are well aware uh, in, in our, with our you know, incredible IMS department uh, under the supervision of Mr. Dunn, they worked tirelessly uh, to ensure that every student in Omaha Public Schools had access to the technology they needed while we were navigating COVID-19 and beyond. So as a result, this original goal uh, needs to be shifted to continue to maintaining our one-to-one -one technology status. As such, the update for this goal will read annually, an audit of lost or and or damaged inventory will be conducted and devices will be upgraded and or replaced as necessary. Moving to strategic priority to the staff, uh, we are not proposing uh, updating any of the goals. Uh, we're simply asking for a slight wording change in the priority itself. So instead of reading recruiting and maintaining, it will read recruiting and retaining. Um, moving to strategic priority three, financial accountability. Goal one will shift from June of 2021 to June of 2022. 
goal two will shift from June of 2021 to March of 2022. For goal six, we are shifting from June of 2022 to August of uh, 2023 and plan to develop, publish, and implement a five-year plan for our facility needs. The updated goal here will read by August of 2023, the district will publish and implement a five-year plan identifying future facility needs and deferred maintenance required to provide learning spaces for students. For goal seven, we're including a 95% target to reflect current supply chain realities. I would, however, like to point out uh, that all of our new schools are tracking ahead of schedule for a fall 2023 opening. Uh, Mr. Wakefield and his team in district operations have been nothing short of incredible in making sure that our phase two bond projects are exactly where they need to meet uh, to meet the needs of our community. And moving to the final strategic priority, Ethic of Care, goal one will remove our June of 2025 end date and update this to a yearly cycle. We're also adding a 2% target goal, which is about 466 students. For goal three, we are removing June of 2025, adding a 3% target goal, which is 136 fewer students uh, suspended or expelled each year, and uh, just slightly tightening up the language a bit. For goal four, we are shifting the date to June of 2022 and adding a 90% target. The updated goal will read by June of 2022, 90% of Omaha public school facilities will meet a level one under APPA standards of quality of facility condition cleanliness and accessibility with no school at a level three or lower. Uh, we do have a third party audit and rate our buildings under these current guidelines. Um, recently it was an 86.6% of our buildings met these set standards. And in conversation with Mr. Wakefield, we feel like 90% is uh, an attainable goal. And our final update is with goal five. Here we're shifting to August of 2022 and including a 5% reduction in our energy consumption goal. As such, the goal will read by August of 2022, a district plan for improved environmental stewardship will be created that projects a 5% reduction in energy consumption over the course of the 22-23 school year for a presentation to the Board of Education. We do meet quarterly with such partners as OPPD, MUD, and other entities to review our energy usage. Um, additionally, we meet monthly with TRAIN to review our, our HVAC usage. So uh, pending board of approval this evening, uh, our next step will be to update the Board of Education uh, next month in March on the progress of the Strategic Plan of Action goals. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Mr. Snow. Thank you, Madam President. This might be for Dr. Logan. The vote was on February 3rd of 2020. Do we have to take a vote since we voted on a draft? I went back and looked for the vote and we were voted on the draft. So basically, I don't think we have to come back for a vote because it's we were voting on you doing the... Well, at that time, we... So, so kind of, we said the same thing I said this evening that it was a living document. Um, we feel that um, we, first of all, we have several new board members, and um, we have had a pretty significant shift in two years. Um, we felt it was appropriate um, this evening that the board uh, vote vote on the on the updates, especially since we um, the, the goals were augmented a bit. Yes, several of the goals were augmented. Mm -hmm. I believe there were four of the nine of you were here when the when the initial strategic plan was created. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Um, and Dr. Crow, you read off a lot. And, yes. Uh, would it be possible, and not, I know you're really busy, but to be able to see both documents and see the changes? Uh, the actual documents themselves or the, the... The changes that you're recommending and the changes in the original document. Oh. It's on there? So yeah, I, we have the original here Perfect. in the slide deck and then the proposed changes over there on the right hand side. Perfect. Um, and I, That's better. Okay. I was thinking actually, I'll, I'll oh, talk, sure. but you don't have to. Sure. Ms. Cracky? The goals are all fine and the, what, what I don't understand is the ability to achieve them. What is going to happen that was different 
that we are going to do to do that reduction of energy. Well, that part yeah, I can understand, but some of the other ones uh, previous to that, I questioned when and how how will that go about being done? Because we have June 2021. 20, if you scroll back up into the one where we talked about students and discipline, that's a very important one. And what, what, is that the first goal? What's the first goal? So up here, the first goal was by June of 2025, proactive efforts focused on improving social. Yeah. Yes. That so one. what I would like to hear is from staff at some time soon. Tell us what they're doing that is going to make a difference. Yeah, I, I think that's completely reasonable. And so, um, at, like I said at the very end, our goal, hopefully, once these are approved, is uh, next month in March, is to come before you and show you these goals that we initially had and show you our progress on it and how we're working on it and what we're doing. And how, I mean, to vote to accept it, I accept that you're going to try to get that achieved. And then you're going to come back and show us what you did or are doing and continue to do to make that Correct. happen. Correct. So that's the important part of what we're doing here. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is just like the first uh, kind of seminal mm -hmm. opportunity that we have to do this. And right. then we will move it to. And, and we do know we haven't been in school. We do know. We do know that there's frustration. Right. Lots. So, you know, that has to be taken into consideration when we're doing that. And so we may have to lengthen those timelines too be, be, uh, to account for all the disruptions. Right, so because this is an annual, okay. like, annual thing, we'll be able to look at okay, it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Mr. Thielen? Thank you, Dr. Holman. Uh, Dr. Crow, I'm gonna just look at number two, goal number two is kind of an example. Um, so, you know, we've, we've moved from sort of an uh, end of the period goal with a set percentage to an annual more kind of uh, as we go kind of goal, which I think is certainly appropriate and, and um, appreciated. What I'm wondering is how far off from our original goal are we going to be with that 4% annual goal? Like our, our 2025 original 4% was probably made at a time before COVID. And now we're moving to an annual, which is year over year, right? So I'm wondering kind of, where, how do we see ourselves as being different when we get to 2025 had we reached the 4% goal versus this 4% annual goal? Sure, that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. So um, I kind of will answer that in two parts. Uh, one in which I won't, I'll ask, your miss, uh, ask Mr. Schmidt Bonnie to come up here and talk to you about the actual uh, numbers. Uh, two, I will say that uh, when we initially created that goal, the end being 2025, there was really no indication. One of the reasons that we wanted to update there is no indication if all of it was going to be done at that last year or if it was going to be leading up to that point, if there was going to be an incremental change. So uh, in uh, conversation with our executive director of research, who was fantastic, uh, we, a 4% growth goal is, is reasonable every year. Phil, Dr. Crow mostly covered it. Um, we've kind of looked at both the work underway as well as our performance through the pandemic and certainly prior across a number of assessments. And in uh, consultation with our amazing curriculum team, uh, we feel this is an approachable goal and will raise the bar a little bit for us uh, in pro producing better student outcomes quicker. Yeah, I, th I think that's maybe the question is, is this a, a more aggressive goal or is it really looking back at that 2025 goal, if we looked at projected that out 4% by 2025, would we be in the same place? This is certainly a more aggressive goal. It also shifts things a little bit as well, looking at the school level. So it isn't just overall, you know, you may have one school to make 8%, another make 2%. It looks at it at each school and, and raises expectations at each site and we'll matriculate that down to the grade level as well to say, okay, what's this look like in Ms. So-and-so's third grade class, so on and so forth. Appreciate it. Thank you. This is really good work. Thank you very much. Mr. Head. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your work on this, and I, my questions have actually already been answered or asked and answered by now. Um, I did just want to real quick say uh, thank you. You know, thank you again for your work on this. I know we already had a conversation in our uh, small group meeting that I'm always a little bit, a little bit skeptical when I hear you know we're reevaluating a, a strategic plan and okay, what's going on there? Are we just kicking the can down the road, or is it actual meaningful change? And reading, you know, reading through these and, and speaking with you guys, I feel like. Um, you know, the new uh, new updated goals here are actually something to strive for. They're actually, you know, uh, uh, solid, you know, objective, measurable changes that uh, that are going to put the district in a better place going forward. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Head. 
Mr. Snow. Thank you. I just have one last question. Uh, financially, it, are we shifting because of the changes on this? Is it going to cost more or less? So we are not currently anticipating any any financial adjustments. Okay. All right. As a result of the, these these changes, right? I understand. Any other questions, colleagues? I make a motion to accept the changes. Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Mr. Teeler. Is second. there a second? Second by Mr. Head. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Cracky. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Teeban. Aye. Erdenberger. Aye. Head. Aye. Holman. Aye. Juarez. Aye. Eight. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much for Thank the presentation you so much. I and being here it. with us tonight and for all the work that you all have been doing. For all right, moving on now to information items. Item J2A, Freshman Academy update. And we have Ms. Christofferson here tonight, along with, give me all the names. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Christofferson. Appreciate it. We okay. welcomed uh, our new Chief Academic Officer, Mrs. Uh, Susan Christofferson, to the thank podium. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. That attention. <laughs> Not good for me. Okay. Good evening. Uh, President Dr. Holman, Vice President Erdenberger, board members, Dr. Logan, and our community. We are happy to provide an update on our freshman academies. Implementation, of course, began this fall across each high school. Benson already had a freshman academy, academy but it evolved to align with our college and career academies and pathways. Westview and Buena Vista high schools will open with freshman academies this fall. Also with me tonight are Katie Hecklever, Supervisor of School Counseling, Delane Havlovic, thank you, no Delane, Coordinator of K-12 Education and Programming, and we've added a great team member to us, Jane Lefke, who is our Teaching and Learning Consultant. She wears many hats. Uh, she works with our secondary partnerships, she helps to support our freshman academy leads and also supports the teaching as a profession. So she wears many hats with us and we're happy to have her joining our work. We as a team believe in a continuous improvement, just like our teachers and our students. This means we're setting the foundation or baseline for the school year. We continuously are seeking feedback to improve and also making sure to celebrate our successes. This is a district-wide alignment through our ninth grades, setting the course for a strong high school experience. We have aligned our work with national standards of practice, and this year's baseline metrics would include monitoring, implementation benchmarks, attendance, dropout rate, and also, of course, the matriculation. Our district has always recognized the importance of the freshman year. This is even more important now as our students have persevered through disrupted learning. We feel a sense of urgency to set the most solid of foundations for a comprehensive system to support our ninth graders. Nine for nine. We currently have and are incredibly proud of all nine supports that we have established to support our ninth graders transitioning to high school. Tonight we have the opportunity to focus in on two. One is Freshman Academy and the other is Freshman Seminar. I bring this slide back to the forefront of our thinking as this data was at the heart of why we knew it was essential to create smaller learning communities with intentional practices for our students. While in year one, we are incredibly proud of what we are working to accomplish together providing extensive support, opportunities, and connections to students and families in the face of today's unique challenges speaks to the commitment of every one of us to seek intentional solutions to give our students our very best. Freshman Seminar. Freshman Seminar is a course our ninth graders are, are participating in, and it's a part of within our Freshman Academy, supporting our students transitioning from eighth to ninth grade. Our students meet the standards for college and career readiness, exploration. In addition, in addition, students use interdisciplinary skills from English, math, science, and social studies that connect effective learning through reading, writing, listening, speaking, and researching. 
All of the work they are doing aligns with the attributes of the portrait of a graduate. We are working very hard to make sure students are aware of opportunities available to connect them to their school through athletics, activities, school and service learning. And as a result, freshman seminar, students will be more connected to their school and ready to move forward in the pathway or academy they have chosen to prepare them for life after graduation. Oops. No, I jumped. There we go. Teachers and staff are collaborating often. This includes soliciting feedback and adjusting based on the feedback to improve our work with our freshmen. In addition to the great collaboration happening in our schools, we have a district leadership team that is actually meeting weekly to monitor our progress and support the broad goals of the Freshman Academy. Our teams have received training on becoming highly effective teams and their master schedule was built for Freshman Academy teams to actually meet weekly. Their weekly meetings are focused on curriculum collaborations as well as how to best support students, which includes data reviews, school engagement activities, and connecting students with additional information to support their transition to high school. Our eighth grade students are provided with an in-depth transition to their high school experience. High school selection, transition lessons, orientation, and registration are all opportunities for students to become familiar with their new school. Following outreach to our middle school families, parents and guardians have actually shared with us they feel reassured and more confident knowing that their student will be a part of a smaller, more connected group by being included in a freshman academy. At high school, each of our high schools have hosted a ninth, their ninth grade students and families to learn Sorry, each high school has hosted ninth grade students and families to learn more about what's available at their school. So they hold us an evening activity in the fall and they'll also be hosting and doing something again this spring. Each school has established their freshman academy advisory board. The advisory board consists of approximately 15 to 20 members. The members include higher education, community organizations, students, alumni, and parents. Their work brings broad perspectives to grow our freshman academies, connect student experiences, and helping to prepare our students to lead. Utilizing our Naviance platform, students have a robust opportunity to begin their college and career exploration. Students can discover their strengths and interests as they plan for, high, plan for college and careers. This provides students with tools and resources to achieve their milestones toward their post-secondary goals. Students have actually had the opportunities to select their pathways at each of our high schools and more than 85% more than 85% of our ninth grade students receive their top pathway or academy choice. After checking with schools, surprisingly, we actually do not have any students who have actually completed the customize your option pathway. Um, but as always, we will continue to work with students through the course registration process. If needed, we would support this option for any student. As evidenced by a system of support we have designed and implemented, we are committed to elevating the voices of our young people and our dedicated school staff. We believe that understanding how our students and staff are experiencing Freshman Academy is beneficial to our continued growth and sustained success. We are hearing from students the importance of having an adult that can assist them both academically, socially, and emotionally. The cohort structure for Freshman Academy and the dedicated time in Freshman Seminar helps to prioritize this connection between students and adults to ensure every student has someone they can count on in order to access the support they need. Sense of belonging. With the implementation of Freshman Academy, we are building a community of peer and adult supports. This culture of inclusion and support creates space for students to connect to their peers and caring adults at their school. This engenders a rich and positive school culture and safe learning environment where every student feels known, loved, supported, and inspired to succeed. And throughout our Freshman Academy, students are actually given voice to express their college, career, and life ambitions. Building connections to the student's future is key to creating student ownership in their learning and building a viable plan for future success. Embedded in Freshman Academy are various checkpoints to ensure that students are on track to meeting their goals for their future. 
And this concludes our updates um, on the Work Supporting Freshman Academy. And we want to thank you for your time. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Colleagues, any questions for Ms. Christopherson? Yeah. You almost got away. <laughs> <laughs> she knew better. I was say, all right. <laughs> um, thank you, and I'm uh, very excited to see how this is progressing. I know one of the things we had talked about in the process of adopting this um, initiative was that we would hope to see some changes in some of our objective metrics like you know attendance and discipline and stuff i recognize this might be a little early to see any of those things uh take place but one question i had was because i do firmly believe that kids uh feeling like they belong makes a difference um have you seen just anecdotally an uptick in um participation in extracurricular events or clubs or something or is it is that something that's too early to see as well that's a great question dr logan and i actually just had conversation about that today <laughs> and we are um, working with schools to see how that progress is going we had connected with them they actually have a list each high school has a list of all of the different things students can be actively engaged with and based on some of the feedback from students, we've shared back with schools, here are some things that the students are actually kind of interested in. How might we be able to maybe create or get them engaged? And so we're hoping to bring those numbers to you at the next time. Oh, that's great, thanks. Yep. I know that when I would have my ninth graders, I would do my darndest to try and get them to sign up for Find Anim something. Anime club, I don't care. Exactly, and I think that's what's so rich about our high schools is that they're very willing and open uh, if a student brings a suggestion, they try to figure that out for them. That's super. Um, I just want to confirm, I think I already know the answer, that there, each high school has its own advisory board mm -hmm. with 15 people that are community, mm -hmm. higher education, so on and so yes, forth. Yes, oh, that is correct. That's great. So none, none of those people are getting stretched really thin. No. They're just focusing on their high school. Yes. Yeah. But yes, I'll just let Delane, he's okay. been working with the advisor. Tell me about that, would you please? Thanks, um, thank you so much. No, we are, um, we continue to design advisory boards and advisory committees for all of our high schools and the freshman academies, um, Susan was right. Um, each school does have their own independent, unique advisory, advisory board that supports their freshman academy. We've been very deliberate about making sure that our partners aren't being stretched too thin. Um, for example, we work with the University of Nebraska Omaha, Metropolitan Community College, to make sure that both of those institutions have the opportunity to present a certain person for every school rather than all of us calling Metro on the same day at the same time saying, will you be my partner? So yes, we have worked to make sure that we haven't um, you know, overreached to our partners and also making sure that our partners have the opportunity to connect with the people in the schools in their own neighborhood. Um, working with Central today, we had some conversations about really wanting to make sure we included downtown businesses in their pathway advisory boards as well. So yes. So how do the students see the impact of this? I mean, how, how do they know there's an advisory board? How does having an advisory board, you know what I'm saying? Yes, so students would get this information as a part of their freshman seminar work mm -hmm. so that they know and understand how the advisory will be supporting them and who they are. I know that they'll probably most likely also be potentially some guest speakers in and a part of their freshman, freshman seminar group. Okay, great. Um, when you said that um, 85% or of the than. students got their top choice. These are ninth graders in our existing high schools. Correct. Um, can you elaborate if possible, does that, did some of them pick pathways in our two new high schools and why well, is that 85% relevant? That shows we've got the right pathways at these schools. I, and what about those 15, what happened to them? Well, keeping in mind, even as they fill them out, mm -hmm. as you work with young people, sometimes they don't always turn their things in on time, or we're just kind of, maybe somebody was gone or somebody was absent, so we are following up with each one to make sure, when I say 100%, that seems pretty bold to say, because <laughs> you know, 100% is 100%, right? Um, so what it is, is there's just a few nuances to make sure that we're following up with everybody. So as far as we can tell, everybody's getting their top choice once we get all their information in. Yes. Um, have we identified some programs that uh, kids wish they could sign up for? Um, I'm going to say the aviation program, for example. 
programs that we need to expand or add at some of these high schools to be able to accommodate or is it's we just have, working out we have not received that feedback at all i don't know if you have anything no different. yeah we are really not to the point of knowing that maybe mm -hmm. we're missing a major major academy or pathway area at this point um, i think what we do know is um for example at north high when we when we reflected on the numbers in each academy and then within within each pathway within those academies the numbers were about equal hmm. with the exception of one academy so that's telling us that there's fairly equal demand amongst amongst the pathways in that particular school um, the 15 percent one of those is probably my own freshman <laughs> um, i know that he is one of the students that's moving from one school to another next year um, and I know he didn't fill out his form in time, so I think some of those counts are my fault. Well, that was that might have been one of my questions because some of these kids are picking pathways in a new, so we're also getting a sense of how many kids are planning on going to different schools. Presumably. Absolutely, and they have had uh, Dr. Carr and Mr. Lee have been amazing. They have been in front of the students who are scheduled to go to Buena Vista or Westview to talk about their programming and have those conversations so that there are not those surprises or I didn't know you were offering that. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, all of that has been, they have been very diligent about making sure they're in front of students and having great conversations. Thanks, I have one last question that has to do with teacher engagement slash teacher feedback. Um, you know, we're all on pins and needles to make sure that everybody can do what they're expected to do how much extra time is being required of our teachers is this uh, uh, in developing these programs the, the are you getting feedback from the teachers that this is this seems like it, they think it's working uh, are their weekly meetings part of their plan time just they're part of the negotiated contract for this year is that they have an opportunity to meet one time a week um, and Actually, there's so, so many minutes, but what we're just saying is one time a week, and it's usually for a partial part of their plan period if they're on a block, so it's about 40 minutes mm -hmm. that they're meeting, and that they have had specific training on how to make sure that those meetings run as efficiently as possible and what their agenda is, and that week could be about, as we spoke earlier, we built it in as a part of the master schedule, so it's dedicated time for them to meet. Um, and it could be talking about what they're working on curriculum wise. It could be helping to support and review data that might take a look at, you know what, we've noticed this commonality amongst the, the students on our team, what, whatever your team name might be. What can we might do to help support so that we're addressing that as a whole freshman class of what that might look like for that team. We've, we've had um, definitely understand where everyone is at with the robustness of this year. Um, but also have found and heard some great joy of this opportunity of some collaboration time together so they feel supported and the students are feeling that as well. That makes sense to me. I know much how much I enjoyed having the uh, curriculum center where every single teacher could I share agree. what was going on. So this is sort of that in a microcosm. Thank you very much. I'm excited to hear more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. schmidt um Sorry, can you talk a little bit about the surveys that have been developed and done for staff, for students? Certainly, um, we have been surveying on a quarterly basis. Um, additionally, we reach out in between uh, to folks in the field, staff, uh, ninth grade academy leads, as well as teachers, as well as students, um, upper class folks in particular, to get ideas for what, what do you wish someone would have asked you when you were a freshman? So we build on each subsequent result, uh, some things belonging, um, reaching out for support or interest um, in extracurriculars are maintained throughout, though asked subtly differently to get a better understanding. So yeah, all that to say, many, many surveys, and we'll continue that throughout the end of the year um, to make sure that we're evolving the programming and tailoring it to the needs of our students uh, and the perceptions of our staff. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Head. Thank you, President Dr. Holman, and thank you for your continued work on, uh, you know, on, on this program and the implementation. Uh, did I hear you correctly when you said no student so far has decided to take advantage of the build your own option? That is correct. Okay. We did ch double check with every school, um, but that doesn't mean that it won't happen, and if it does, we'll, we'll be ready to support. Oh, I, I actually, I, 
that kind of caught me by surprise when uh, when you originally said it, because I know a few months ago, you know, there was a lot of thought, and my, I mean myself included, that you know maybe these pathways were going to be you know rigid and kind of and and so giving students that option would be a good idea. But I guess my takeaway from that is that um, you know these these pathway options are more inclusive and expansive than a lot of us had originally thought, and they are actually doing a great job, you know meeting the needs and, and the, the wants of our students, is that fair to say? I, th I think based on what we're seeing at this point, yes. Perfect, I've never been happier to be wrong before, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Mr. Thielen. God, I'm sorry, oh, I, apologize. I apologize. I wanted to respond real quick. I think um, what's important to note too is that some students um, um, who thought they wanted their own pathway realized they, you know, they came with thought they wanted to choose your own pathway, and then when they went to sign up, they were like, "Oh well, no, this I'm actually in going to be in IB, for example, and that IB is a pathway, you know, or um, the med, the the health alliance is a pathway." So we found a lot of um, uh, discovery that we kind of knew all along, um, but you know, it's important for young people to discover it on their own. Mr. Thielen. Thank you, Dr. Holman. I know this is a big question and you might not have the answer yet, but are we kind of, it sounds like you might be starting to get this data. Do, do we have a sense of how many students, how many more students than last year are choosing a school other than their home school? That part we do not have quite yet. Okay. Um, we're just not in that space as a part of the school student yeah. assignment plan process and everything. Okay. So Thanks. we're not there yet. I have a question. Ms. Juarez? Um, I don't know, if, I don't know the grade level of students, but just say, for example, hypothetically, if an Afghan student um, or someone who's brand new into our school system, are they going to need extra help in trying to make these choices when it's just so different from, you know, where they may have traveled from and arrived in our school district? I think what is so great about how we've been working to approach it, it's really from a comprehensive view that it's not just the school counselor, it's not just the advisement, it's not just the freshman seminar teacher, it's a collaborative group of people who are having the conversations. Even the group that we're meeting with at the district level has a lot of different voices and a lot of different lenses so that we can make sure that as a student is even coming into our school system for the first time, that there is ample opportunity to have conversation with a multitude of people who can help guide the student and better understand their opportunities. Thank you. We feel that that was very important. We want every student to be engaged. Any other questions, colleagues? Well, thank you, team, for being here tonight and sharing this awesome information. We are so excited about um, our Pathways and Academies and our Freshman Academy and look forward to the next informational session that you provide for us. Thank you so much. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, moving on to receipt of reports. We have two reports on the agenda this evening. Item K1, 2021-2022 Official Membership English Learner Refugee and Language Report. And item K2, Head Start Monthly Board Report, December 2021. There is no closed session for tonight. Let the record reflect that the board meeting adjourned tonight at 7.59 p.m. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks for coming.